from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with digital coverage of IBM Think 2021. Brought to you by IBM. Welcome back to IBM Think 2021, the virtual edition. My name is Dave Vellante, and you're watching theCUBE's continuous coverage of Think 21. And right now we're going to talk about banking in the post-isolation economy. I'm very pleased to welcome our next guest, Lickett Wagley, is the general manager of global banking and financial markets at IBM. And John Dagenen is the global CTO and vice president and distinguished engineer for banking and financial services. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us there. Great, Great to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Look at this current economic upheaval. It's quite a bit different from the last one, isn't it? I mean, liquidity doesn't seem to be a problem for most banks these days. I mean, if anything, they're releasing loan loss reserves that they, they didn't need. What's, from your perspective, what's the state of banking today? And hopefully as we exit this pandemic soon. So, so Dave, I think, uh, like you say, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a state in a picture that's uh, you know, significantly different from what people were expecting. And, and I think some way, in some ways you're seeing the benefits of a number of the regulations that were put into into place after the you know the the financial crisis last time around, right? And and therefore this time, you know, a health crisis did not become a financial crisis because I think the banks were in better shape. And also, you know, governments clearly have put worldwide a lot of liquidity into the into the system. Um, I think if you look at it though, uh, maybe two or three things ready to call out. Firstly, there's a there's a massive regional variation. So if you look at the US banking uh, industry, uh, it's extremely buoyant. And I'll come back to that in a minute in the way in which it's performing. Um, you know, the banks that are starting to report their first quarter results are going to show uh, profitability that's you know, significantly ahead of where they were last year and probably some of, the, some of that best performance uh, for quite a long time. If you go into Europe, it's a completely different picture. I think the banks are extremely challenged out there. And I think you're going to see a much bleaker outlook in terms of what those banks report. And as far as Asia Pacific is concerned, again, you know, because they did, they have come out of the pandemic much faster, their consumer business is back uh, into growth. Again, I think they're showing some pretty buoyant uh, performance as far as, uh, as far as banking performance is concerned. I think the piece that's particularly interesting and I think came as a bit of a surprise to most uh, is, is what we've seen in the US, right? And in the US, what's actually happened is uh, the investment banking side of banking businesses uh, has been doing better than they've ever done before. There's been the most unbelievable amount of acquisition activity. You've seen a lot of what's going on with the SPACs that's driving deal rate, you know, deal um, based fee income for the banks. The volatility in the marketplace is meaning that trading income is much, much higher than it's ever been. And therefore the banks are very much seeing a profitability on that investment banking side that was way ahead of what I think they were they were expecting. Consumer business is definitely down. Uh, if you look at the credit card business, it's down. If you look at uh, you know lending activity that's going down going out, it's substantially less than where it was before. There's hardly any lending growth because the economy clearly is, is flat at this moment in time. But again, the good news there, and I think this is a worldwide picture, not just in the US, the good news here is that because of the liquidity and, and some of the special measures that the government put out there, there has not been uh, the, the level of bankruptcies that people were expecting, right? And therefore, most of the provisioning that the banks did um, in expectation of non-performing loans has been, I think, a, a, a much more, much greater than what they're going to need, which is why you're starting to see provisions being released as well, which are kind of flattering, flattering the income, uh, flattering the income. It, I think going forward, though, you're going to see a different picture. Is the re thank you for the clarification on the regional divergence. Is that, and you're right on. I mean, European Central Banks are, are, are not in the same the same position uh, to to affect liquidity, but is that Nuance is that variation across the globe. Is that a is that a blind spot? Is that a is that a a, a concern uh, or the other other greater concerns? You know, inflation and 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 the, the 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 pace of the the return to the economy. What are your thoughts on that? So I think I think the um, the, the the concern um, you know as far as the European marketplace is concerned is. Um, you know, whether, whether the, the performance there, and particularly, I don't think the level of provision in there was quite as generous as we saw in other parts of the world. And therefore, um, you know, is the issue around non-performing loans in, in Europe going to hold the European 
uh, European banks back? And are they going to, you know, therefore constrain the amount of lending that they put into the economy? And that then, um, you know, reduces the level of economic growth that we see in Europe, right? I think, I think that is certainly, that is certainly a concern. Um, I, I would be surprised, and I've been looking at, you know, forecasts that have been put forward by various people around the world around inflation. I would be surprised if inflation starts to become uh, a genuine problem in the in the kind of short to medium term. I think in the industry there are going to be two or three other things that are probably going to be more, you know, going to be more issues, right? I think the first one, which is becoming top of mind for chief executives, is this whole area around operational resiliency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, regulators universally are making very, very sure that banks do not have a technical debt or a complexity of legacy systems issue. They are, and, and you know, the UK has taken the lead on this and they are going so far as even requiring non-executive directors to be liable if banks are found to not have the right policies in place. This is now being followed by other regulators around the world, right? So, so that is very much top of mind at this moment in time. So I think discretionary investment is going to be put, uh, you know, towards um, uh, solving that particular problem. I think that's that's one issue. I think the other issue is what the pandemic has shown is that, and 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 this was very evident to me. And I mean, I spent the last three years out in Singapore, where you know banks have become very digital businesses, right? When I came into the U.S. to in, in my current role, it was somewhat surprising to me as to where the U.S. marketplace was in terms of digitization of banking. But if you look in the last 12 months. Uh, you know, I think more has been achieved in terms of banks becoming digital businesses than they've probably done in the last two or three years, mm -hmm. right? And there's a real acceleration of that uh, digitization, which is going to continue to happen. But the downside of that has been that the threat to the banking industry from essentially fintechs and big techs has exact, you know, has really accelerated, right? Right. I mean, just to give you an example, PayPal is the second largest financial services institution in the U.S., right? So that's become a real problem, I think, which the banking industry is going to have to deal with. Uh, and, and I want to come back to that, but but now and let's bring John into the conversation and let's talk about the tech stack. Look, it was talking about whether it was re resiliency, going digital. We certainly saw with the pandemic, remote work huge, huge volumes of things like PPP and, 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 and mortgages and with dropping rates, et cetera. So John, how has the tech stack been altered in the past 14 months? Great question, Dave. Uh, and it's top of mind for almost every single financial services firm, regardless of the, their sector within the overall industry. Every single business has been taking stock of how they handled the pandemic and the economic conditions thereafter, and all of the business needs that were driven by the pandemic. In so many situations, firms were unable to service their clients or were not competitive in serving their clients. And as a result, they've had to do very deep uh, uh, architectural uh, transformation and digital transformation around their core platforms their systems of analytics and their systems, their front end systems of engagement. In terms of uh, the core processing systems at many of these institutions, some in many cases, they're 50 years old. And with any 50 year old application platform, there are inherent limitations. There's an inflexity, uh, inflexibility. There's an inability to innovate for the future. There's a speed of delivery issue. In, a, in other words, it can be very hard to accelerate the delivery of new capabilities onto an aging platform. And so in every single case, um, institutions are looking to hybrid cloud and public cloud technology and prepackaged AI and prepackaged solutions from an ISV ecosystem, a software vendor ecosystem to say, as long as we can crack open many of these old monolithic cores and surround them with new digitization, new user experience that spans every channel and automation from the front to back of every interaction, that's where most institutions are prioritizing. Yeah, banks aren't going to migrate. Uh, they're going to they're going to build a, an abstraction layer. I want to come back to the disruption. It's so interesting. 
We had the Coinbase IPO last month. You see Tesla and MicroStrategy, they're putting Bitcoin on their balance sheets. Jamie Dimon says traditional banks are playing a smaller role in the financial system because of the new FinTechs. Look at, you mentioned PayPal, there's Stripe, there's Robinhood. You get the Silicon Valley giants have this dual disrupt disruption agenda. Apple, Amazon, even Walmart, Facebook. The question is, are traditional banks going to lose control of the payment systems? Yeah, I mean, I think to a large extent that has that has already happened, right? Because I think if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at the experience in Asia, right, and you look at particularly organizations like Ant Financial, uh, you know, in India, you look at organizations like Paytm, the, you know, very substantial chunks, particularly on the consumer payment side has actually moved uh, away from the banks. And I think you're starting to see that in the West as well, right? With organizations like you know, Klarna that's coming out with this, um, you know, pay, you know, buy now, pay later type of schemes. You've got Paytm and then, as, so you've got PayPal and as you said, Stripe uh, and, and others as well. But it's not just, um, you know, in the payment side, right? I think, I think what's starting to happen is that there are very core parts of the banking business, you know, especially things like lending, for instance, mm -hmm. where again, you are getting a number of these um, fintechs and big, big tech companies entering the marketplace. And, and, I, and I think the threat for the banks is this is not going to be small chunks of market share that you're going to actually lose, right? It's, it's, it's actually, a, it could actually be a Kodak moment. Let me give you an example. Uh, you know, you will have just seen that Grab is going to be acquired by one of these packs for about $40 billion. I mean, this organization started like the Uber in Singapore. It very rapidly got into both the payment side, right? So it actually went to all of these mom and pop shops and it offered QR based, um, QR code based payment capabilities to these very small uh, retailers. They were charging about half or a third of what MasterCard or Visa were charging to run those payment rails. They took market share overnight. You look at the remittance business, right? They, they went into the remittance business. They set up these wallets in 28 countries around the ASEAN region. They took huge chunks of business completely away from DBS, which is the local bank out there from Western Union and all of these, all of these others. So, so I, I think it's a real threat. I, I think Jamie Dimon is saying what the banking industry has said always, right? Which is the reason we're losing is because the playing field is not even. This is not about playing fields being even, right? All of these businesses have been subject to exactly the same regulation that the banks are subject to, you know, regulations in Singapore and India are more onerous than maybe in other parts of the world. This is about the banking business recognizing that this is a threat. And exactly as John was saying, you got to get to delivering the customer experience yeah. that consumers are wanting at the level of cost that they're prepared to pay. And you're not going to do that by purely uh, sorting out the channels and having a cool app on somebody's smartphone, right? If that smartphone okay. is supported by archaic processes and legacy systems, wherein I apply, you know, like, like today, you know, you make a payment, your payment does not clear for five days, right? Whereas um, in Singapore, I make a payment, the payment is instantaneously cleared, right? That's where the banking system is going to have to get to. In order to get to that, you need to alter the whole stack. And the really good news is there are many examples where this has been done very successfully by incumbent banks. You don't have to set up a digital bank on the side to do it. An incumbent bank could do it, and it can do it in a sensible period of time at a sensible level of investment. A lot of IBM's business across our consulting as well as our a technology stack is very much trying to do that with our clients. So I am personally very bullish about what the industry could do. Yeah, I mean, taking friction out of the system, sometimes with the, in the case of crypto, taking the, the, the middle person out of the system. But I think you guys are savvy. You understand that, you know, like, yeah, Jamie Dimon a couple of years ago said that he'd fire anybody doing crypto. Janet Yellen and says, oh, I don't really get it, you know, Warren Buffett. But I think as technology people, we look at it and say, okay, wait a minute. This is an interesting Petri dish. There's, there's a fundamental technology here that has massive funding that is going to inform, you know, the future. And I think, you know, big banks are going to lean in, some of them and others, others won't. Uh, John, I'll give you the last word here. But for sure they're leaning in. Uh, so, so just to, to, to think about uh, something that Lickett said a moment ago, the reason these startups were able to innovate fast was because they didn't have the legacy. They didn't have the spaghetti lying around. They were able to be relentlessly laser focused on building new, using the API ecosystem, going straight to public and hybrid cloud and not worrying about everything that had been built for the last uh, 50 years or so. The benefit for 
existing institutions, the incumbents, is that they can use all of the same techniques and tools and hybrid cloud accelerators. In terms, and, and we're not just thinking about um, uh, retail banking here. Your question around the industry disruption from Bitcoin, blockchain technologies, new ways of processing securities, it is playing out in every single securities processing and capital markets organization right now. I'm working with several organizations right now exactly on how to build custody systems to take advantage of these non-fungible digital assets. It's a hot, hot topic around which there's uh, incredible uh, appetite to invest and incredible appetite to innovate. And we know that the center of all these technologies are going to be cloud forward, cloud ready, AI infused, data infused technologies. Guys, I want to have you back. I wish you had more time. I want to talk about SPACs. I want to talk about NFTs. I want to talk about technology behind all this. You Really great conversation and really appreciate your time. I'm sorry, we got to go. Thank you. Thanks so much indeed for having us. It was a real pleasure. All right, the really pleasure was mine. Thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante for IBM Think 2021. You're watching theCUBE.